Good evening, everyone. I'm Daniel Green, president of the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Don't Let This Get Around, The Many Lives of Ben Hecht, a conversation with David Denby and Adina Hoffman. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in the Newberry's reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. The Newberry recently reopened our doors to readers and visitors. You can visit our website, newberry.org, to make an appointment to do research in our reading rooms. At that site, you can learn more about our many digital resources, online classes, and virtual public programs like this one. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and the present. You can also stop by the library without an appointment Tuesday through Friday afternoons to visit our exhibition halls and our Rosenberg bookshop. Following Illinois state guidelines for COVID-19 restrictions and for the safety of our community, our public programs will remain virtual for the time being. Our conversations at the Newberry series is now in its 10th season. This series, generously supported by Sue and Melvin Gray, is one example of the Newberry Library's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement. Bringing together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. During the program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. As time permits, our speakers will respond to your questions. It's very good to be together on Zoom today, but I can't help mentioning that if we were together in person at the Newberry's building, we'd all have walked in the library building from Ben Hecht Way. This block of Walton Street in Chicago received that honorary moniker back in 2004. As we'll hear tonight, Chicago shaped Ben Hecht's career in important ways and the Newberry is honored to be the repository for Ben Hecht's archive. His wife, Rose Hecht, donated these papers to the Newberry in 1979, and countless researchers have visited the library since then to learn more about Hecht's varied and fascinating work as a Chicago journalist, Hollywood screenwriter, novelist, and anti-Nazi advocate. Our two speakers tonight will provide insight on all those chapters in Hecht's life. It's my pleasure to introduce them now. David Denby is a staff writer at The New Yorker and author of an extended introduction to a new edition of Ben Heck's 1954 autobiography, A Child of the Century. Denby's books include American Sucker, Snark, Do Movies Have a Future, and Great Books, My Adventure with Homer, Rousseau, Wolf, and Other Indestructible Writers of the Western World. He's also published a collection of his film criticism from The New Yorker magazine and a study of high school English teaching titled Lit Up. He's currently working on a group biography of four Jewish Americans, Leonard Bernstein, Betty Friedan, Norman Mailer, and Mel Brooks. David joins us today from New York City. Hi. Hi, David. Idina Hoffman is an essayist and biographer whose recent book, Ben Hecht, Fighting Words, Moving Pictures, was a finalist for the 2020 Penn Jacqueline Bograd Weld Prize for Biography and was named one of the best paperbacks of the year by the Sunday Times, which dubbed it a revelation. Her other books include My Happiness Bears No Relation to Happiness, A Poet's Life in the Palestinian Century, Till We Have Built Jerusalem, Architects of a New City, and with Peter Cole, Sacred Trash, The Lost and Found World of the Cairo Geniza, which won the American Library Association's Sophie Brody Award for Outstanding Achievement in Jewish Literature in 2012. Adina is joining us today from New Haven, Connecticut. Hi, Adina. <laughs> Again, during the program, feel free to enter questions into the Q&A feature if you're joining us on Zoom or into the comments on Facebook Live or YouTube, and we'll take some of those questions towards the end of the program. Adina and David, thank you again for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, no, um, hi, David. <laughs> Hello, hi. everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, I think we thought we'd just jump right in and try to reckon with those many lives of Ben Hecht. Uh, my sense is that, um, in general, not everyone knows who Ben Hecht 
was. Um, maybe in Chicago, we're in a kind of virtual Chicago right now. Um, people have a slightly better sense. But my my feeling, having spent a lot of time talking to people about Ben Hecht, um, is that people usually have one of his lives in mind. Um, and so we thought, David and I decided that we would try to take on a bunch of these different lives that he led. He, he lived large uh, and he acted on many different planes, often at the same time, sometimes at odds with himself. And so we wanted to see if we could take them on both individually and sort of in relation to each other. Um, David, I don't know if you wanna add to that um, introductory. Well, he's got to be one of the most contradictory human beings who ever lived. And uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but the way you handled these contradictions in your short biography of Ben Hecht. I have to tell you folks that the short biography is one of the most treacherous and difficult <laughs> of all literary forms, particularly with a voluminous life like Hex, because it requires concision and it requires folding one thing into another. Um, and uh, Adina's book is with, without doubt the, one of the most extraordinary short biographies I've, I've ever read. So. You did it, kid. Um, okay, thank you. And I but think so, I would yeah. have enjoyed that book uh, yeah. as much as I did. So, I mean... So here do... we go. So off and running we yeah. are. I mean, so here's the thing about Hecht. He himself knew how multiple he was. And he talked about himself. Yeah. He said, there are always a surprising number of me's in operation. So I wanted to actually start with a question for you, David, and maybe actually just by way of background, since not everyone knows everything about Ben Hecht. Um, he was born in 1893 uh, or 1894, depending on which of his own accounts you listen to. His gravestone says one thing, his passport says another. Um, he grew up, he was born on the Lower East Side, but grew up in Racine, Wisconsin, and got himself to Chicago as a very young man uh, and became a newspaper man. Uh, maybe we could have our first slide there. Newspaper man. <laughs> so we have Hecht, there is. the very young Van Hecht. And so I what wanted to ask you, David. holding there? Is that a He's holding some sort of bird. I don't know what he was up a to. A raven or something. Yeah, exactly. And you can see how young he was. He was literally, this was 1910. He fled after just a couple of days of summer school at the University of Wisconsin, decided that college was not for him. And he got a job at the Chicago Daily Journal as a picture chaser, what was known as a picture chaser. He would have to go find a photograph of somebody who'd just been murdered so they could put it in the paper the next day. And he quickly moved up and became a reporter. And so I wanted to ask you, David, you're not exactly a newspaper man you're like a magazine man you've yeah. spent a lot of time working on deadlines and with word counts and my own sense of hacked and you also write about this very well in the introduction that you did to the newly reissued um version of uh, hacked memoir has just been reissued by yale university press with a wonderful introduction by you and you talk about how his years as a newspaper man and maybe a chicago newspaper man in particular informed what he became and what he did later. And I just wondered if you could talk. Yeah. Well, in different that. ways. The, the <clears throat> journalists he hung out with, um, according to him, were all extremely literate. They read and they were, they were reading the moderns. They were reading Proust. They read Nietzsche. They, you know, they were aware of the literary culture around them, but they were too, how shall I put it, too careless for literature, too frivolous for teaching. Um, they, 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 what they believed in um, besides literature was the daily newspaper, which was a kind of temple that had to be constructed every day and then torn apart and reconstructed the next day. Uh, and what he loved about them was that they, they saw through everybody, that they saw through power, that basically, that, and particularly local politicians, um, uh, their, you know, various kinds of uh, mayors and councilmen and so on. And what Hecht was attracted to was not, you know, serious muckraking because there was great journalism in Chicago, as we know, in the early part of the century. Um, and he didn't get to Europe until after the First World War was over, right, 1919. But he liked the scandal side. When I mean, he was, how old was he, 18, 19? Yeah, he was a kid. He was a kid. I mean, he had this picture-stealing job, which has to be the lowest journalistic trade I've ever heard of. <laughs> and then he, he would do stories. Um, he got, and then a little bit later, when he flipped to the other paper in town, one of the other papers in town. Right, the Daily News, yeah. The Daily News, he sort of created a genre, which was he'd go out in the morning and 
find someone. I mean, it could be it's someone who had an interesting shop, right? Or someone who did something weird or a woman with eight children or something like that. And he'd write it up that afternoon as a life of, of quote unquote ordinary person. And this, that has been obviously influential uh, in just taking it from the New York side on decades later, people like Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill, but I'm sure every city had them. But anyway, the, 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 what he brought into Hollywood screenwriting later on was partly what he learned as a newspaper man about life and a certain uh, raffish, abrupt, hard-nosed, funny attitude towards life. I mean, you know, there was a lot of soft movie making in, thir in the 30s, particularly at MGM under the, you know, Stahlberg and Mayer and so on. That was not the kind of picture that he wrote or that, that his friend Mankiewicz wrote. You can see Mankiewicz currently in, in not a terribly good movie. I think we agreed <laughs> Mank. But anyway, the two of them created a kind of, and others created a kind of new tone. And Charles MacArthur, we gotta give him. And Charles MacArthur and yeah, yeah uh, Hecht's buddy. And they wrote, they wrote the front page together and they adapted uh, 20th century into an uproarious movie. So yes, what he learned in Chicago of the way people really live, yeah. uh, a kind of wised up view. I mean, it was urban, it was fast, it was funny, and it, it, it accounted for a fair number of uh, melodramas, comedies, and so on in the 30s. And I think it had an ongoing influence later uh, on things like Humphrey Bogart movies and maybe way down the line on David Mamet. Sure. Um, and, and uh, you know, Adams, Aaron Sorkin, so it's- And I would even say, I mean, at a very basic level, they also just got material. I mean, MacArthur was also a cub reporter in Chicago during those same years. And they, the two of them turned this uh, experience that they had as, you know, beat reporters in Chicago into the front page, which is one of the great plays and then movies and then becomes His Girl Friday. Um, the actual scene of the kind of Cook County courthouse, that is, that they just took it from what they knew and it became not just in the, the terms that you're absolutely right about the way they talked and everything, but it was the stuff of what they knew. And he did the same with gangland, like the gangsters he was covering in Chicago became the gangsters of Joseph von Sternberg's underworld and Howard, I don't wanna just describe it to the director, but Scarface, which is also a hecked movie is just totally drawn from his life as a reporter on the Chicago city streets. We um, should say that when he got to, to Hollywood, he claimed to have got the idea for underworld by when he met a stool pigeon in the lobby of the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Right, then a that's new what he hotel. said. He had various versions, but that was but, one of them. <laughs> yeah, there was a guy he knew from Chicago who was working right. for the district attorney feeding the guy, you know, stuff about gangsters. And, and this guy fed him stories, right. yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, about gangsters and their mistresses. And he turned it into the screenplay of Underworld. But then when, it, when von Sternberg made it into, uh, Matt, you describe it very well, as this shadow you know, visual, visual fantasia heck was right. sort of disgusted. Yeah. And when he got the, the Oscar, the first Oscar for screenwriting, um, he, he refused it, right? Yeah. Initially, he and then he sent it back. He said, yeah, sent basically, it back. it's an outhouse on the Parnassus. Uh, the yeah, the outhouse on Parnassus. Then he was going to use it um, right. as a doorstop. You know, the other, we'll get to the movies in a minute before we move on to our next life, because there are so many lives we have to get yeah. to the other. I did want to add one other really important thing about Hecht and that stint of his as a newspaper man. And I think it has to do with his language. I mean, you talked about his attitude and with Hecht, he's a man of words. And he has these amazing descriptions, you know, from the memoir where he describes his mentor, this guy, Sherman Duffy, who was the sports editor. Yeah at, I think it was at the Daily News, I may be confusing the two, maybe it was the, actually the Daily Journal, where he basically is like giving him writing lessons. And he says, um, let me see, I wanna get this right. He says, basically, um, uh, be sure your style is so honest that you can put the word shit into any sentence without fear of consequences. Um, and then Hecht followed Duffy and his other newspaper buddies around to these late to these taverns, these kind of late night bull sessions where they're just talking and he's absorbing the language of these newspaper men. And he writes, 
the whiplash phrase, the flashing and explosive sentence, the sonorous syntax and bullseye epithet of the way they talked, he said, this was the great event of my first years as a newspaper man, um, to which I yeah. say, like, who needs journalism school? <laughs> you know, yeah. He has uh, a fantastic ear yeah. for prose. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and that is true, you know, 30 years later, uh, when, he's, when he's writing Child of the Century, and there are sentences you could just, they sing. Yeah. You just want to read them aloud. Um, he could do the short rat-a-tat sentence. You know, the, he could do the long sentence with multiple clauses and a surprise ending. I mean, he was, he was a masterly yeah. stylist. Um, and it's more than a newspaper style. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's a talking style that is also very literary. Finally. Right. Which actually maybe brings us to our next life. Do you want to uh, slide, please? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. We're skipping over. <laughs> yes. Well, he was hanging out with with serious fellows and, and women in Chicago in 1910 and thereafter. Um, uh, the so-called Chicago Renaissance. No one called it that at the time, right? And but there, there was Dreiser, and who was already famous, and Sherwood Anderson, who was about to become famous. Um, and who was a good friend of Hecht. I mean, that's the other important yeah. thing to realize is just how social this was. I mean, Carl Sandburg was, was Ben Hecht's buddy on the newspaper. They worked at the same newspaper. They had adjoining desks, and he and yeah. Anderson were hanging around, you know, in the evenings. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, then they started get, gathering um, at, at someone's house, which became a kind of literary salon, a little bit on the edge of town, right? Yeah. Uh, and this yeah. was before Margaret Anderson, who is this extraordinary young woman who started the little review and within a couple of years had every avant-garde writer in the world writing for her. Well, here's, if you look at the list here on the left, Joyce Pound, Ford Maddox Ford, Sherwood Anderson, and so on, translations from La Forgue and Rambeau. It's an amazing publication. Yeah, it is. Uh, it flourished um, and Hecht was part of it. He wrote stories. Yeah, and I mean, one of the, the interesting thing here, I mean, there's so much that's interesting here. So, I mean, here you see the, I mean, Margaret Anderson, for those of you who don't know, and as, she, again, the sort of virtual Chicago here, I feel like if you are in Chicago, you must know of her, because this is an amazing thing that Chicago produced. She, I mean, now we can talk about James Joyce and Ezra Pound and Ford Maddox Ford and the others, but she kind of discovered these people, not single-handedly, but she launched American literary modernism as we know it. And what's weird to think is that Hecht was at the center of all this. He was very much one of her pets. She published him in almost every single issue um, right out of that, the Fine Arts Building on Michigan Avenue. And her, her um, motto here, you can see on the magazine, is making no compromise with the public taste, which is kind of hilarious when you think about Ben Hecht, who then who was writing for her with great earnestness and thought he was a great man of letters, but who of course proceeded to make a lot of compromises with the public taste. Wonderfully, we should say, because I think you would agree with me, David, that That's where it this gets is not what we need to remember Ben Hecht for. Yeah, his, well, do you want to say something about Eric Dorn? Or, I mean, I, yeah. I struggled well, through it, but it was hard. Well, so, yeah, I mean, so it's important to know that Hecht was a really terrible judge of his own talents, and he he really thought he was a novelist, at least in those years. He fancied himself a man of letters, and he was writing these kind of very heavy breathing stories for Margaret Anderson, very earnest, and, and essays and whatnot. At the same time, he was writing short stories for H.L. Mencken's The Smart Set, which he was whipping yeah. off just to make a buck, allegedly. There's so Over much better. sketches, comic. Right. They're so much better. I mean, they're not like immortal, yeah. but he was much better when he wasn't putting all this pressure on his own ego and on his, his sense of his art. And so the novels are very much in that sort of high flown vein. And so Eric Dorn was his first novel and it got a lot of attention. It's actually fascinating to, to note sort of in retrospect what people were paying attention to. If you go to the Newbery and I have to say the Hecht collection is one of the most amazing. I spent a lot of time in archives all over the world. That collection is amazing. And among the items that they have are two scrapbooks of um, the reviews clipping service put together of Eric Dorn, his first book, and then Gargoyles, his second novel. 
every newspaper in America reviewed these books and they didn't all praise, there was a lot of criticism of Keck, yeah. but he got a lot of attention. And, and you have to remember at the time, there were also many, many more newspapers. Uh, when people talk about the death of local journalism, it's real, it's, so, it's just so palpable. There are like 150 reviews of just from- It's every... death for the book trade now. Nah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, but he was known and not good novels. I can't tell anyone yeah. to go out and read Ben Hecht. But I will say that first of all, they were part of this literary apprenticeship of his. They helped to train him to do the things that he would do better later when he stopped taking himself so seriously. And in a sense, when he got to Hollywood, and we'll get to that soon. Um, but there is a way, and I would argue that this is where his importance as a novelist lies, is that he cleared a space for other novelists who would come later, especially male Jewish novelists like Bello and Roth and Mailer. Hecht has a novel that he published in 1931 called A Jew in Love, which is a really weird book. It's not a good book, but it's a fascinating book. It's a really um, well-written book in the sense of, not well-written in terms of beautifully constructed, but sentence for sentence, you get all that stuff that I just read. Yeah. It's like there's electricity flying off the sentences. But more importantly, it's a book in which it's a Jew in love. There's a lot of sex and there are Jewish characters who are depicted in really unflattering terms. I mean, it's interesting in terms of what he would become involved with later in terms of his Jewish activism. People accused him at the time of anti-Semitism and he was having rabbis stand in pulpits and denounce him for what he had written. And my feeling is that he made it possible for people like Philip Roth to write books like Portnoy's Complaint Portnoy. and Bellow and himself- Jews and sex was a little bit, uh... Uh, unknown in the literature of the 30s and particularly on the left. Yeah, exactly. Um, socialists and communists who, uh, however outspoken they were about other things, were very reticent about the discourse of sexuality. Absolutely. Yeah. And so even, and Saul Bellow himself actually says, he, he wrote a review in, in, you know this, David, but not everyone does in the Times uh, uh, book review of Hecht's memoir. And he said, and this is the young Saul Bellow, he's in his 30s, he's just become acclaimed and another sort of adopted son of Chicago who says, when I was young, we, my friends and I would go around to the used bookstores looking for Ben Hecht books because he cleared the way, he showed us the way yeah. to write about the speech of immigrants and these particular landscapes. And so again, like I can't say go read those books, but I do think that he made it possible for people like Bello to write the books that they did. I wanna launch another literary project here. Um, some publisher, how about a Ben Heck reader? <laughs> okay, I mean, and what would be in it? Well, you could have a, maybe two of the best screenplays, maybe Scarface and Notorious, and then maybe some of the fiction that, that re re reads well in excerpts. And, and definitely the stuff you were talking about from, I don't know if you actually named it, but those columns, A Thousand and One Afternoons in Chicago are wonderful columns, by any standard. Selection yeah. of journalism, selection of his Zionist Okay, I'll sign on. on. I'll, I'd like to have that book. <laughs> <Sold> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I think we need to move on because we, we're going to run out of time. We got to okay. get to the movies. We got to get to the movies. And so, okay, slide, please. <laughs> we have our magician who's there we go. giving us slides. All right. I think everybody should just absorb here this, what is appearing before you all. Let's give them a second. Yeah. Oh. To, um, Okay, then we just blocked it out. Paul but, McHale said that um, he wrote about half the most entertaining movies made in Hollywood, by which she meant the 30s and the 40s. And a screenwriter named Jules Firthman wrote the other half. The one thing that, things that um, links them is that they both worked with Howard Hawks, great director. Right. Anyway, uh, you, and, have to, yeah, go ahead. you have to do the telegram. You can't, it may okay. be cliche, but you can't avoid it. They screwed it up in Mank. They did. Yes. Hecht was in New York with Rose, his second wife, right? Yeah. And it was, what, 1925? And he 26, was living 26 like that, yeah. beyond his means uh, uh, on Beekman Place, which is this just exquisite couple of blocks on the east side on the river. He was broke. He, he was lying in bed reading uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Right. And the telegraph guy showed up and it was a telegraph from his buddy Mankiewicz. They had both known each other in New York. They had both been part of sort of the Algonquin uh, round, you know, the, the, the yeah, the, the, the round table, circle yeah. at 
Yeah, at the Algonquin of New Yorker writers and other local journalistic wits. And Mankiewicz had gone out and wrote him, you want to do it or shall I do it? Uh, you can do it. Go ahead. Um, and now I'm, I don't want to blow it. Um, oh, here, I got it. Will you, you accept $300 a week to work at Paramount as a writer? Um, that's just peanuts. There are millions to be made out here and your only competition is idiots. Don't let this get around. How's that? Not bad. That's it. So he went out uh, and uh, went, I mean, basically he was situated in New York and in Nyack in particular. Nyack is a lovely town up the river from New York uh, where he lived with Rose and with uh, MacArthur and Helen Hayes, his wife in, in a nearby house. And, but they would, he would go out there, what is it, 20 times? He'd go out there with right. servants and pictures and books and everything. And he worked on and off to the movies for the rest of his life virtually. Right. So here's the big question. I think, you know, I mean, so, you know, you quoted Pauline Kael and she also called him the greatest American screenwriter and Jean Godard, who, you know, obviously knows something about the movies also said that he created 80% of what is used in Hollywood movies today. And that was 1967. So everybody agrees or not everybody, but most agree on his accomplishment. But then you run into this question of his own contempt for the thing that he was most acclaimed for. Heck, and now, okay, we read the telegram and I have to say, this is parenthetical and this is like breaking news, but I have actually begun to theorize and I could be wrong and I'm, I hope that I will be corrected, but it just occurred to me that that telegram, which is very famous as this thing that Herman Mankiewicz wrote to Ben Hecht, I spent a lot of time in that Ben Hecht archive and I never saw that telegram. And knowing what I know about Ben Hecht, I almost wonder if Ben Hecht didn't make it up, but that's just neither here nor there. Well, we don't have I, Mankiewicz denying it. We don't have, have, that's true, that's true. Uh, I mean, it's so, it's so clever that, it would why should he deny it? It's also, who knows? It sounds something that, that either of them could have said it easily. Yeah. So, okay, that's not the point. What I wanted to do was to read to everyone what you know, David, but not everyone knows, is that while he's busy being acclaimed, Hecht is also so full of, of ostensible loathing for this medium, for the movies. He says in his memoir, Child of the Century, he calls the movies one of the bad habits that corrupted our century. Uh, he calls the movies an eruption of trash that has lamed the American mind and retarded Americans from becoming a cultured people. There you now, go. That's like the greatest Hollywood screenwriter speaking. He worked on something like a hundred movies. I mean, he didn't get credit on a lot of things. He right. was- uh, More, it's more like 140. It's a lot, 140. a lot of- It was an early version of what became a very lucrative profession, probably starting right. with him, the script doctor, as well as the things that he definitely he wrote. Um, you know, like 20th Century and Scarface and Nothing Sacred and Notorious. Notorious and, he yeah. doctored um, a great many movies, including Gone with the Wind. And may I just briefly tell the Gone with the Wind story because it's so Please. funny. Yeah. Um, Gone with the Wind, they started shooting it and uh, it wasn't working. Uh, they shot the burning of Atlanta uh, and never, no one was happy with George Cukor's work as, as director. So he was fired and Victor Fleming was brought in who is just still working on The Wizard of Oz. And Fleming said, where's this original script on this thing? It was by a playwright named Sidney Howard it had been through right 18 different writers and everything. Including F. Scott Fitzgerald. Including F. Scott Fitzgerald. So they had a reading that lasted three or four days uh, and subsisted uh, on a diet of bananas and peanuts and it was, Selznick, the producer, David O. Selznick, who read Scarlet, and Victor Fleming, the director, who read Red Butler. And <clears throat> Hecht sat there listening and taking notes. At one point, uh, Selznick fainted dead away um, from this ridiculous thing. Anyway, out of, the, out of this reading, developed a kind of t sexual tension between Red and Scarlet, which works, still works very well in the not embarrassing second half of the movie. The first half is pretty much racist kitsch, right? But, but the second half, and I don't know how much Hecht had to do with that. Um, although if you're gonna raise this question, you might ask, how did he feel about the first half of the movie, which has the happy slaves returning? Did you mention the fact that he couldn't be bothered to read the novel? I mean, he yes, really, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, he, he really worked on it only <laughs> if he was, would not, 
have to read the novel, Selznick right. is furious. Anyway, I don't know how much he did. He edited the script and, and shaped the, you know, the movie that- It said still... that he had a lot to do with, you know, yeah. and part of, Hecht, part of the complication of Hecht, and this is my question about where, what do you do with the contempt is that he wasn't looking for credit. He didn't want to say like, I wrote Gone with the Wind. He really wanted to like take the money and run. You know, and it's interesting when you try to actually track what he did on the movies that he doctored, you know, there are certain things that we know about, like that amazing last speech in Foreign Correspondent, the Hitchcock movie, yeah. where Joel McRae gets up in front of the microphone and the bombs are falling all over London. And he's like, you know, keep your lights on America. They're the only lights left in the world. That yeah. was heck. Like he was called in by the producer to, to work on this thing in the middle of the night and to do it. So we know that, but a lot of it is very vague. Like what happened? Like it said that he worked on things. I could never find like shop around the corner. He had something to do with, I don't know. Yeah. Like Stagecoach. Stagecoach. Roman Gilded. Holiday, years later. Roman Holiday, yes, yeah. which I is mean, also so very interesting. Movies. I mean, yeah. it's Okay, fun. but wait, wait. But I want to ask, though, what do you do? This is a really major thing, and it's something that I reckoned with as I was writing my book. Like, what do you do with his contempt? Do you take it seriously? Do you think it's just a way to sort of be like the man of letters who is just so good at what he does and doesn't, he has contempt for this thing? Or do you think the contempt was real? I mean, it's- I think it was a way of sort of one-upping the studio bosses and producers. Because here he was the highest paid screenwriter in town and he was contempt publicly contemptuous of, of what they did. Was it really his attitude? I mean, it, you know, he also had a lot of good times out there. I exactly, mean, yeah. When he wasn't working, um, you know, there were a lot of witty and interesting people passing through Hollywood in the 30s and the 40s, not just all the writers, you know, like F Fitzgerald and Faulkner and the rest and rest of them, D Donald Dog and Stewart. There were a lot of uh, it was a great exilic community, the Los Angeles in the 30s and 40s. Absolutely. He had a hell of a time. Yeah, I think uh, when he wasn't working and then he'd go back to New York and and, you know, complain about Hollywood. Right. So I think it's a bit of a put on. Um, it, it assuaged his ego. And I mean, I, I made this bizarre uh, comparison to, to Sir Arthur Sullivan. Sir Arthur Sullivan wanted to be the British Mendelssohn. He, wanted, he wrote oratorios and symphonies that are of no interest at all. But of course, what he was great at was these scintillating opera, operettas he wrote with W.S. Gilbert. And it's this disjunction between what you admire in Hex case literature and what you're good at which is screenwriting. Right. So one way you deal with that is to be to put down right. what you know what you're good at. I also, I mean, I, I I write about this in my book, but my sense was that there's an element of, you know, so I mentioned His Girl Friday, which is one of my favorite Hecht movies, although he also his name doesn't appear on it except as it's having been adapted from the front page, but he did, we know he worked behind the scenes with Charles Lederer who was working on the script. Um, but my sense is that as in that movie where you have this, um, divorced couple, Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell of reporters, and they're ostensibly at odds and they're bickering all the time, but they're still totally in love, it's clear. And my sense is that sort of Hecht was, had this relationship to Hollywood that like sort of Hollywood had his number and he had its, you know, like yeah. this kind of sense of tension that's actually about some sort of deep love underneath all of the, the arguments and the-, and well, the That's um, a good way of putting it. <laughs> um, and also, I mean, he and, he directed seven movies of his own. How could yeah. he have created this art form? Right. And directed now, the movies aren't very good. And I'm not sure that, you know, there's much to look at it. I'd like, I, I remember the scoundrel with Noel, Noel Coward. Coward making his screen debut. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I, as I think you said, they, they tend to be verbose and maybe he needed producers. He needed uh, producers. His neck. He needed coarse studio bosses telling him you can't do that. You got to yeah. make it short and snappy. Um, absolutely. I mean, I would say one thing that's interesting about the movies that it was hecked by himself some of the time, but often with MacArthur. And they had a bunch of movies that they made in Astoria in Queens, actually. And what's interesting about those, aside from the weird kind of curiosity of Noel Coward in his screen debut and Claude Rains also in this very first Crime Without Passion, which is a really weird, interesting movie, not a great one, but an interesting, yeah. smart movie. Um, they were very 
early on, like they were given the right to both write and direct these movies by Paramount Pictures, which set them up there. That was not done at the time. They predate Preston Sturges and other directors who wrote their own movies. So while they were not Preston Sturges, let's just make it understood, like they didn't have that kind of talent for directing. And they basically thought if it's got a good script, it'll be a good movie. You just have to turn the camera on, which is of course ridiculous. Um, they yeah. did actually do that before other people were doing that, which is- And these were never gonna be money-making projects. No, I mean, no they, and they were very much bohemian intellectual New York- art films before art we films. used that right. phrase. Right. Yeah. So Unfair. how much did he hate re movies? You know, really it, it, was, it was something that he brandished over everybody's yeah. head and made himself feel better. So maybe while we're talking about brandishing, we should move on to his next life, which was, slide please. <laughs> oh my god there's the brando yeah uh, brando 22 Heck. years old yeah so uh, and where do we start i mean do you want to i don't know i can just i mean i could hold forth on this subject i don't know if there's a particular well he's, he said he never thought of himself as a jew until the late 30s which is who um as you said he grew up on the lower the first nine years whatever it was was on the lower east side and then his relatives would come out to racine carrying suitcases full of salami and whitefish right exactly and they would have kind of jewish eating festivals in racine right Wisconsin. and his first language was yiddish i mean his come on so the, the idea yeah. that he became a jew in 1939 and actually there's an you mentioned mankowitz before so when they were in new york before they got to hollywood they actually had a magazine that they ran together called the lowdown in which they published all kind, kinds of things about, what is it like, uh, Alfred Puppick student and things like that. This it's is a very, humor. very Jewish. Not, not very of, high quality. Right, yeah. okay, but whatever. The point is he was working it out and I would argue that his sense of humor was always Jewish and he was writing books like A Jew in Love in 1931. So this yeah. notion that he became a Jew in 1939 is obviously a very, deliberate statement on his part. Um, and maybe this slide is actually slightly misleading because this is already a slightly later thing. So what you're seeing here is Paul Mooney, which is to say Scarface dressed up as, you know, basically Tevia is the name of this character he's playing in this pageant that Ben Hecht wrote with music by Kurt Vile, the young Marlon Brando, Celia Adler, who's a sort of star of the Yiddish stage. But when Hecht initially, I mean, basically what happened is that in the late thirties, Hecht um, was his somehow his consciousness was raised. He somehow this is before he says he became a Jew in 1939. The truth is that he himself was already writing stuff in 1937, 1938. He has a very, very spooky story. Maybe that's enough of that slide, because actually that's already a little distracting with the Israel stuff. This is actually before that he um, wrote a story in which he describes something that he calls the great international pogrom and that will happen in Europe. And he's predicting this, it's a kind of prophecy. And he describes this incredible scene of basically American Jews waking up in the morning and going to their breakfast table and opening the newspaper and reading with horror of this thing that is occurring and people driven from their homes and slaughtered. And at that point, he's just saying a million people, but he's basically predicting what's going to come. And, and when they did read it in their newspaper, and it was they on did. Page 10. They eventually did. And so, in the, right. Well, but in the meantime, though, he was started to write these articles. So, what had been a thousand and one afternoons in yeah. Chicago, he started writing a thousand afternoons. A thousand one afternoons in New York for PM, this sort of liberal magazine. And they were very much yeah. about Jews. They were like Jew, Jew, Jew. He kept using the word. It was as if he wanted to upset American Jews who didn't want to mention how their Jewishness. They just wanted to be Americans and be left alone. But yes. Hecht was sticking it in their faces. And because of one of these articles, or several of these articles, he was basically recruited by a very interesting guy who we don't have time to talk about too much, but he was a Palestinian Jew who had come to the United States to basically raise money for a Jewish army that would serve alongside the allies in Palestine. His name was Peter Bergson. It was actually kind of numb de guerre. He was really Hillel Cook, who was part of a very illustrious yeah. rabbinical family in Palestine. And they read, he read Bergson, who was a very kind of interesting guy in his own right, read Hecht's articles and understood 
this is our man. We need an American guy. And this guy, he's got panache. He seems really devoted to the Jews. So let's get him. And so there's a whole saga of they're trying to recruit him. It, it released um, Heck's pugnacity towards something other than putting down Hollywood bosses. Exactly. It released it towards a goal, which exactly. was initially to alert the country that the Jews were in terrible danger in, in Europe. And he was explicitly in, enraged by the Hollywood uh, Jews. After all, Hollywood, except for Zanuck, who ran Fox, was really, the studio bosses were all Jews. Jewish. All Jews. During the 30s, they, they kept any, any criticism of Germany, any even mention of it, out of the movies. That's a whole backstory in itself. I wish he had, you know, come to this realization in about 1935, how important it was to assert that you were a Jew. Right. That, that what they were afraid of was that, was that it, if there was war, it would be called a Jewish war. And, right. and that, you know, it's part of the fear of, of the right in this country. Um, by the time the yeah, 1939-40, um, he thought that's absurd. I mean, we're being slaughtered. Uh, and anyone who's uh, in Hollywood or is among his theater and journalistic friends in New York who's sort of hiding a Jewish identity is just being cowardly. This right. is the moment. And you, you, hit, you hit something that I think is linguistically very interesting. The word Jewish feels anodyne. The word Jew has a kind of branding force. And mm -hmm. he knew that. And he said it over and over and over again to make people wake up to the point where people began to, you know, find him obnoxious. And well, crazy. so, but there's a slight thing that happens and this is what's interesting. So he, in spreading the word about the Holocaust, he's not just spreading the word, they're taking out full page ads in the paper saying, pageants. Like, you know, and well, the pageants are actually sort of more already kind of like refined. The ads are in your face. They're saying like genuine human beings, $50 a piece, like trying to use his scathing black wit to get people to pay attention. Yeah. And then he has these pageants like Kurt Vile and, and Billy Rose and Moss Hart have the, and heck staged this enormous pageant in Madison Square Garden, the largest crowd ever. We will never die. This is 1943. They're pretty, I've seen they're pretty hard to sit through. I mean, oh, they're hard to sit through, but they're and earnest. This is Hecht at his most earnest in terms of trying yeah, to raise. And the music is not Wiles' best. Right. Okay. Music, Fair enough. But they were enormous public events. They were, and they did the work. I've actually talked to people, uh, Israelis who whose parents were in DP camps, who say like, or I guess it was too early for the DP camps. I guess they it was after the fact, but they were like Ben Hecht was the. They knew about Ben Hecht that he had yeah. been trying to raise awareness of this but what happened and this is what's interesting about Hecht and his pugnaciousness and where his genuinely kind of um his feelings of wanting to do good in the world met something more complicated is after the war when this same group of activists Peter Bergson and his people Peter became Bergson. much more involved with what was basically a kind of terrorist uprising in Palestine and so they were in America they were trying to raise money to smuggle um, Jews DPs and others into the United into Palestine through the British blockade while Menachem Begin and his comrades who were their comrades were like running a terrorist campaign against the British in Palestine and hecked in typical fashion didn't mince words, he took out an ad personally, I think he paid for it himself, a full page ad in many newspapers in the United States with what he dubbed a letter to the terrorists, my brave friends. And he basically said, every time you blow up a British train, you wreck a British arms depot, basically every time you kill a British soldier, the Jews of America make a little holiday in their hearts. Just think about that. Just like think yeah. about what that would be if there were a Muslim American who took out an ad right now. It's insane. And heck, when you say he got in trouble, that's actually what got him into big trouble with his friends. People like Mankiewicz who were really upset, like you are basically wrecking my life as an American Jew. You are making us all look like terrorists. He was promptly boycotted or blacklisted in Hollywood. The highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood, the most acclaimed, became basically persona non grata. Um, and it's about markets. I mean, let's face it. Basically, there was a British market that now they couldn't sell movies to if Ben Hecht's name was on a script. Um, but he built his career for I mean, well, it was Notorious, which was which was written in 1945. And, and came out in 1946, but by then he was in deep trouble. 
yeah. be because the British market was too, as you say, was too important for the studios to ignore. And if he was blackballed and they wouldn't show any, anything with his name on it, um, he didn't get work um, for, for, for quite a while. Right. Yeah, Mankiewicz said, um, well, Ben discovered he was a Jew uh, in 1939. Uh, six years ago, and now he's a six-year-old Jew. I mean, <laughs> that's how he's acting. So, yeah. I mean, it was this impacted rage that finally had a release, right? Because he thought he could actually do something. Yeah, he could actually have an effect on something. He couldn't stop the Holocaust, right. but here was this nascent possible state of Israel, and a, you know, the terrorists trying to uh, convince the British to leave. Um, it, suddenly, he was a man of action. Well, of course, without leaving Nyack, he never went to Israel. <laughs> He never went. Yeah, which is no, also he never went. Right. Um, I don't know if he was actually interested at all in, you know, post 1948 in the state that it. it so, I mean, he I and mean, we this is a whole other saga. He basically said enough. I'm done. And then later on, much later, he wrote one of his very last books is about actually uh, this what's known as the Kastner case, which he kind of was called okay. back in, onto the field. Unfortunately, I think we need to move on to our next life because we're not going to have time to do yeah. all of this. So, okay, we're going to go very quickly. Um, I don't know when we want to go to, okay, let's just try to do this. Yes. So this is actually, this is a good one. Um, Heck the man in relation to women. Um, he was definitely attractive to women though. As you can see, he's not a handsome man. Okay, he wait, was, this is Rose, just for those who don't know. Wonderful this is wonderful white, white Rose. He was middle height. He had he was barrel chested from uh, lifting weights and having uh, boxing sessions in, early in the morning with some private uh, boxer who came to his house, where, uh, including in Los Angeles. Um, but he definitely, he was the world's greatest talker and he, I think he genuinely loved women. He um, genuinely, he loved a lot of women. And unfortunately okay, he loved for a Rose, lot of women. Not just Rose, yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot in Child of the Century about prostitutes and whores, which was what young men did in 1910, 1912. It wasn't so easy for middle-class men and women to get to bed, together in bed. Um, so, but it's, the writings are, he, he was not a Victorian in the sense of believing in a double standard. He believed that women had the right to sexual pleasure. And the writing of, about uh, these, whorehouse visits is interestingly ambiguous because he, he says the men stood around talking to each other putting mm -hmm. down women and showing off for each other it was each other that they were interested mm -hmm. in not in not so much in the sex yeah and, and if you actually and hecht a lot of hecht's movies i mean i don't i think hecht was very straight i don't think yeah actually, but, but his his there is a weird thing with his male the the, the they're often triangles in hecht movies there, and there are a lot of men who are very engaged with each other in a way that's not just about friendship. There's some extra charge um, and it's complicated. And the women are there too, but movies like Gunga Din, I mean, that's a, like a kind of male romance. In the, some I think way. one of the reasons we, we, we love this shift from the front page to His Girl Friday is that, is that it, the tension now is heterosexual. <laughs> And it's a marriage, it's, as you say, where they, they fight all the time, but they still love each other. Right, right. Um, yeah, the male bond that showed up in a lot of movies, not just Hex movies, but uh, you know, all kinds of Westerns and right. so on, uh, where men would go through things together and women were sort of marginal. When he, he writes about that, but uh, the man, how he, he was never jealous of a man and he, he never lost his cool over a man. But anyway, but I, the interesting thing, though, uh, if you read Child of the Century very closely, he, he understands, he sees a certain disturbance in the sexual life um, that the men, some of them, you know, really wanted to be women and some of the women really wanted to be men. He had a sense of what we now call fluidity right. of sexual identity. For such a macho man. <laughs> What's that? For such a macho man, he had yes, a- he was very sensitive to this. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, you get this sort of macho attitudes towards women in 1915. On the other hand, you get this feeling that there's something more complicated going yeah, on. Absolutely. I mean, I do think that if we're going to talk about Hecht and women, we have to, I want to give a little shout out to Rose here, who is a complicated figure. And I mean, yeah. I unfortunately, you mentioned how short my biography is. So there's certain stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor. And she's a fascinating figure. She's kind of a tragic figure in a way. But I mean, 
the archive that exists at the Newbury is Rose's doing. And I can't say that it's like Rose was such a, um, there she is again, Rose. And this is Rose in happy days. I mean, Rose didn't always look so happy. She actually had a pretty difficult life and not just because of heck, she made her own life really difficult. She was a really difficult person, I must say. And one of the things, I mean, when you're in the archive, I mean, so Rose saved everything, but everything, like every scrap. And she was desperately in love with him from the moment she met him and she understood his genius and she wanted to honor it. So she saved every scrap of paper and every just all kinds of junk. And it ended up in this great heap that the very valiant archivists and librarians at the Newbury rescued in one weekend, I've been told from her apartment. It was basically a kind of extreme hoarding situation. She did not sort it out. It was just these yeah. heaps of stuff with fried egg on top, but she did save it. And the other thing that she did, and this to me was very moving and very disturbing as I was writing the book, I would find she annotated everything. She was a maniac for like commentary. And, and in her later years, we should say, Heck died many years before she did. And their daughter, Jenny, who was um, the joy, you know, basically the joy of Rose's life, aside from Ben Hecht, her daughter, Jenny, who was an actress, was her pride and joy and Jenny was also kind of screwed up and she ended up she was an actress and she ended up she had a bunch of bit parts in movies like The Jesus Trip and she was an actress in the Living Theater and eventually died of either a heroin overdose or suicide as a very young woman so Rose was alone but what she did in her aloneness in later life was to annotate maniacally all of these documents so that you're sitting okay. in the archive reading you know a letter from David Selznick from 1946 and Rose is going up and down the margins he cheated us he slandered us I mean it's not a that's a, I don't remember that it's actually Selznick, but everybody is yeah. either being denounced or that's the kind of crazier side. But she often was giving very lucid, she was a really good writer. She was a very verbal person. She was really smart. And yeah. she would often comment on, I, I mean, the description of how they first met, which I put in my book, I got from one of these scrawled things of roses. I was carrying this book. He stopped me. She wrote it all down as if she was sort of anticipating. She was sort of acting as a kind of research assistant to the biographer or biographers who she hoped would come along one day. And it's kind of wrenching because it's also, you know, she's got crazy things like um, files called, what is it? I actually wrote it down. So I remember Saul Bellow as prototype of the graceless disciple. I mean, she's always denouncing people and this, yeah scoundrel but there she was saving this stuff and recognizing that he would that somebody would want to read these papers one day i think we want to have some questions but i just we want to do. yeah we've like gone just on. quickly say something yeah. about child of the century which yeah. uh, came out in 1954 and is this enormous compendium of stuff i mean uh there's a lot of cracker cracker barrel philosophizing that no one was strong enough to tell him to cut out uh, I mean, some of it is interesting in a kind of mild way, but the, and there's fantastic uh, evocation of Chicago, uh, of of New York, um, of Hollywood. Would that there were more about Hollywood, but it is one of the great American autobiographies. I mean, yeah. uh, miscellaneous and verbose as it is. Um, I, there's another publishing project. Someone should produce a shorter version. <laughs> of it. Edit him. How many books yeah. can we generate here? <laughs> All right, so maybe we should. Yeah, we should take some. Thank questions. you, thank you, David, and thank thank you, Adina. Uh, thanks for thanks for the ideas about future uh, book <laughs> projects for the Newberry too. Uh, I think there's moments in the papers um, in some of the books that Hecht owned, also Adina, where um, he's smoking when he's reading, and there's burn marks on the page. And yeah. Rose writes, you know, Ben, stop smoking while you're reading. <laughs> <laughs> you get a you get a sense of their uh, right. relationship with each other. Um, let me ask you a few, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, some of them are, are, are more um, factual or myth busting. Um, Andrew, who was writing on Facebook, uh, wonders about two mysteries. He, he asks, did Hecht really cover a great flood in Indiana as he described in the child of the century in a great segment, I couldn't find a record of such a flood. Um, and then he also asked, it's been suggested that his death was premature and suspicious. Is there anything to that? Well, uh, he sort of, did he make up half make up the flood? <laughs> he pro I wouldn't be surprised if he made up the flood. The, the flood. Whole. I mean, there's a lot of he actually himself describes in Child of the Century a lot of sort of fake news. I mean, he created he and some photographer went out to the park to the I don't know. They talked about, first of all about like pirates on Lake Michigan, but they also dug a trench 
about the earthquake that happened in Chicago, like they made it up um, yeah. and Hector's made this. So I don't know about that particular flood if it did or didn't happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't happen. As for the story about his premature death, I've never heard that. I mean, he had a heart attack. He died while reading E.E. E. Cummings' uh, The Enormous Room. Um, I don't know that it was suspicious. I'd, I'd be curious to hear what that's about. Um, he lived hard. I mean, he wasn't a big drinker like some of these guys, most of his friends. I mean, we talked about Mankiewicz. He died uh, young of alcohol, as you know, if you have seen Mank. Um, and so did Maxwell Bodenheim. They all, well, actually no, Bodenheim was murdered, sorry, but he would have died of alcoholism if he hadn't been murdered. Um, Charlie MacArthur totally drank himself to death, but heck, actually, I mean, he drank, but he didn't drink himself to death. I've never heard that. I don't know. I do um, no more. Uh, Tom asks, here's an interesting, what should I read first of Hector writings? Oh. Hmm. Uh, I guess you read The Child of the Century. Um, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, it's going to be hard to, you could probably find Eric Dorn in a library. I, I think that's the strongest. <laughs> I, I would say, actually, I would say that for sure. I would also, there is a newly or relatively newly reissued version of A Thousand and One Afternoons in Chicago. I think the University of Chicago Press issued that up again right. a couple years it's ago. A, with that's a great, wonderful. It's a, yeah. Um, there's a great introduction would, by uh, Bill Savage. Who's exactly, been yes. With the Newberry, right. Right, which is a really wonderful book. Um, I actually really love some of Hecht's less well-known memoiristic books. There's a wonderful book. It's his last book. It was actually posthumous. It's called Letters from Bohemia. And it's not only Hecht. It's actually, we'll give you, we didn't really talk about Hecht as friend, which is a major mode. He knew everybody. He was friends. I mentioned Sandberg and, and Sherwood Anderson, but he was friends with all kinds of people. George Gross and Catherine Hepburn and Kurt Weill and this Thank one and that one. Lady Lenya. Um, so Letters from Bohemia is um, a set of portraits, I think there's seven of them, of seven of his talented dead friends, Mencken and MacArthur and Bodenheim and G Jean Fowler and some others, and it consists of their letters to Hecht with a short portrait of each of them by Hecht. It's a beautiful book. It's really warm. It's like the kind of generous side of Hecht. Um, so I would also suggest that. Well, that's, that's a great, great idea. Great idea. Um, let me sneak in two more very, um, very quick ones. And then I think we're going to have to, unfortunately, call it a, call it an evening. I could listen to you two talk about Hecht for much, much longer. Um, so someone, I'll just, I'll stack them here and then you can answer them both. Someone says, is frankly, my dear Hecht line. Do we know that? Um, and then a bigger question, did he ever try to get a studio to film one of his novels or otherwise try to turn one of his novels into a screenplay? Gee, I don't doesn't ring a bell, does it, Adina? It does not. I think he had a very clear sense of these two different realms, which are maybe, it's a false dichotomy that he had in his head. But he, th I think he thought the literary thing was over there and then the movies were over here. And when, when he wanted to bridge the gap, he would make his own movie. He would write his own script and film it. But I don't think, I think he would have thought it was a sort of um, bastardization of one of his great novels to have been adapted for the for the yeah. screen. I don't remember his ever commenting on it, but that's my own sense. As for frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. We have no way of knowing the kind of archaeology of that script. I, I don't know, and I actually not, don't. It's not in Margaret Mitchell's text. I don't remember. I read it when I was twelve. Well, I, heck I didn't read it. <laughs> heck didn't read, never read it, so <laughs> you probably didn't miss much. But yeah. I don't think we can know. And that's the other thing about this era. And you know, we didn't even mention Hecht had what was known as his script factory. He had all these guys writing for him, people who are not well known, who were often writing Ben Hecht scripts. So we just don't always know, even the things that he did get credit for. Did he actually write those? It's not clear. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But Adina Hoffman, David Denby, this has been such a pleasure. Thanks, thanks for joining us Thank at the Newberry you. to talk about Ben Hecht, who is obviously such an important figure um, at our institution as as well. Well, now um, you guys have two publishing projects. That's right. <laughs> All Thank you have to do is find some money for them. That's right, and our doors are open. So I hope to see you both here again soon. Um, Thank but you. thanks, thanks for joining Thank us virtually tonight. Much. It's fun.